Kathy Kokas with Kitsap Economic Development Alliance. Welcome to today's webinar. We're happy to have you join us. Um, folks are calling in um, slowly. I think we might be getting a bit Zoom weary, but we think we have really great info for you today. Um, just a few housekeeping before we turn it over to our speakers. Um, today's panelists, um, to kind of get us caught up to date on where we are, will be Representative Derek Kilmer and John Keese from the Kitsap Public Health Department. We thank you both for spending time with us this morning. Want to remind you once again that we are working hard to keep you updated in all things COVID and business related. Yeah, we are sure. a special page here. Yeah, um, you're not sharing. Ah. Uh, okay, just a second. My apologies, folks. Okay, so I'll just back up a slide or two so you can see these are our panelists. Um, thank you again. COVID-19 um, page on our website will have multiple current information on funding, resources, links for you to check out. And Teresa's done a fantastic job of creating this side panel um, divided by category. We have the back to work resources, including the Kitsap County Pathway to Recovery Playbook. And then probably the best thing that we've seen for um, focused on business is the toolkit for reopening done by the Madrona Group. Um, you'll find that and other information and resources on that same page. I just want to take a few minutes. Um, there seems to be some confusion. I mean, there was confusion for me. I had to make a cheat sheet to figure out which um, grant had which criteria. So currently open is um, Kitsap Cares phases two and three. So if you're an unincorporated or incorporated Kitsap County, you should be applying now. Um, these grants are up to $5,000. It is for rent reimbursement. Your business had to be open as of 7-20-2018, and you must have three to 15 full-time equivalents, not counting the owners. No double dipping with PPP. If you've got idle or the state emergency grant, you're ineligible. This is a first come, first served. Port Orchard Cares will reopen on Monday, and this is for companies inside the Port Orchard city limits. It is also rent reimbursement. Um, their date of business opening is just a year ago. It's anything under 15 employees, including the owner. It will be need-based. If you did get an idle loaner grant or PPP, that is okay, as long as you are not double dipping. And this is reviewed by a committee with final selection by the city. Bremerton Cares pretty much mirrors Port Orchard. Um, it opens next Tuesday and is open for until for a week. And then another phase will open on the 25th. This is also need-based review by a committee so we encourage you to go to this website that we've created, kidsapcaresmallbiz.com, which will provide details on each program and will also announce any new programs and will give you an overview, what you will need to fill out the application and what documents you need to upload. So we encourage you to check those out, figure out which ones you qualify for and then apply. And this is what that page looks like. You can see you could choose which one, and if there were to be any additional ones, it would also show up on top. 
So um, we'll have Q and A um, during. You can post those in the chat box. And now I would like to introduce Congressman Kilmer. Thank you. Okay, I uh, I think I'm on. Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, thanks uh, as always to the Kitsap Economic Development Alliance for for having me on and for the amazing work that they do to ensure our uh, our local businesses are getting the best and most accurate information. You know, obviously we're navigating some really uncertain economic times and it's vital to ensure that the voices of small businesses, of em employers, of entrepreneurs are, um, are heard in these conversations regarding our, our economic resiliency and our uh, hopefully our growth and future development as well. So thank you to Kita. Um, for consistently making this opportunity available through this webinar series and for all the other work you do. Um, as a guy who worked for their sister organization in uh, Pierce County, the Economic Development Board for Pierce County for about a decade, I'm, I'm just very grateful for our uh, local economic development leaders. Um, and uh, I also, in light of that former job, I also want to say to every employer who's uh, on this Zoom uh, a, a simple message, which is thank you. Uh, thank you for employing people uh, in the face of an unprecedented and global pandemic. Uh, thank you for uh, adapting in new ways to continue to serve your customers. And, and thank you for supporting the livelihoods of your employees. It will be all of you uh, leading our economic recovery. And uh, I always think it's important that your elected officials have your back. Um, what I want to walk through for the next few minutes is just an update on the latest discussions in Congress and what the federal government's working on. Uh, in the interest of talking with you rather than at you, I, I hope to leave plenty of time for, for Q&A. Since the pandem pandemic began, we saw four federal relief packages that were passed into law, focused on helping small businesses, helping medical providers and frontline workers. Uh, but I think it's clear that folks are still struggling and we need to take more action. And you have seen discussions underway between the House, the Senate, and the White House. And I kind of want to give folks just a sense of where some of the areas of agreement are and where some of the areas of disagreement are and, and why they matter uh, to employers here, uh, here in, in uh, Kitsap County. The cornerstone, you know, one of the key pieces of this is trying to defeat this virus. And that means having adequate funding for testing, contact tracing, uh, and, um, and treatment. A big piece of that is testing. Without getting testing right, we aren't gonna be able to open the economy like we all want. I think people forget the time frame sometimes, but it was over six months ago on February 4th, uh, I led a bipartisan bicameral letter with Senator Murray and nearly 50 members of Congress, Democrats and Re Republicans to call for more tests to be produced uh, and forward deployed to communities like ours that were on the front lines of this. And unfortunately it's now August and uh, frankly, we still aren't where we need to be as a, as a state or as a nation when it comes to testing capacity. It, it's disappointing in part because we've really lacked a federally coordinated national testing strategy to significantly increase testing capabilities in our nation. You know, public health professionals have said that our nation needs, at a bare minimum, 500,000 tests per day. Um, it wasn't until the end of June that our nation reached that number. But most have suggested that the number should be more like five to 10 million tests per day. So why does that matter? Testing is a key piece in the puzzle to getting control of the pandemic. You gotta find out who's sick, isolate the sick so they aren't out infecting more people, contact trace, uh, figure out who came into contact with sick people and ideally keep them quarantined so they're not out infecting people as well. And that's what's worked in South Korea and in Germany and elsewhere. But the U.S. has really struggled uh, on that front. And uh, frankly, the blueprints are there for what's needed, but the right levers haven't been pulled yet. You know, so I've been pushing for a more aggressive use of the Defense Production Act so we don't have these shortages of swabs and reagents and other supplies. I've supported legislation to require more active federal coordination because in the absence of that, you see states competing with each other for scarce resources, and it kind of replicates the dynamic that you've seen in the toilet paper aisle at the grocery store. This is one area where the House and the Senate uh, are currently not on the same page. Uh, the House uh, put forward $75 billion to ramp up testing to that level that I suggested and to make sure that every community in every state uh, is getting access to the resources they need. The Senate is uh, proposing 15 
billion dollars for that purpose. And what we're hearing from public health experts is that's just not going to cut it. The second key component, and thankfully there's some agreement on this, is doing more to help our employers. You know, it's almost tried at this point to say that small businesses are the backbone of our economy. I, I actually think of about small businesses as kind of our economy's star running back. They're the ones who are racking up the tough yards and scoring the touchdowns when we try to get out of recessions. And right now, as a consequence of this pandemic, a lot of our small businesses are getting tackled behind the line of scrimmage. So I think part of the role of the federal government is to call some plays and do some blocking for our star running back. That's part of the reason you saw in the CARES Act, things like the Paycheck Protection Program and the EIDL loans. Um, but I wanna give you some insight into what I think could be coming. The CARES Act included something called the Employee Retention Tax Credit. It was frankly pretty thin and probably doesn't have the utility that, that uh, would be ideal. In the HEROES Act, which has passed the House, passed the House three months ago, uh, there was included a very significant expansion of that employee retention tax credit. And the idea here is to encourage businesses to retain their employees so workers can continue to receive income uh, and, and benefits without having to seek unemployment. And I think part of this is a recognition that the best way to handle unemployment is to keep people employed. The employee retention tax credit also um, makes it easier to resume normal operations as we turn the dial on reopening. I mentioned this because not only was it included in the HEROES Act, there's a standalone bill that I'm the sponsor of called the Jobs Credit Act, uh, which would make these targeted improvements to the employee retention tax credit. That is a very bipartisan bill, and it's a very bipartisan bill in both the House and in the Senate. And so if I were, uh, and it's always dangerous to speculate, but if there is a, another COVID deal, um, I, I think it's very likely that an expanded uh, enhanced employee retention tax credit will be a part of that. There's also discussion underway around another round of the Paycheck Protection Program uh, as well. Um, I, I, I'll also mention there's a couple other things that we're working on um, driven by uh, uh, listening to employers in Kitsap County. There's a bill called the Restaurants Act that would set up a a revitalization fund for independent restaurants just to deal with some of the really longer term structural challenges that they're facing in the face of this pandemic, recognizing that there's about 11 million Americans who are um, employed by those restaurants and we want to make sure that we're protecting their economic security as well. There's another bill that's called the Restart Act, which also provides some additional small business relief and I'm happy to talk about um, any of those uh, proposals. Thankfully, I think in terms of the small business resources, there's more agreement than disagreement in that uh, in that area. Um, uh, and I see the question in the in the chat. The Heroes Act actually extended the assistance uh, not just to um, uh, to for-profit businesses, but also to nonprofit organizations and all types of 501c organizations, including uh, 501c6s. Uh, the Third area, and this is an area, unfortunately, where there's substantial disagreement, is with regard to assistance um, for uh, state and local and tribal governments. So why does this matter? Um, uh, because of this uh, medically induced coma that our economy has been put into, every municipality, every tribal government, um, and every state is projecting very significant shortfalls. Uh, back in June, Governor Inslee announced that the state of Washington is uh, expecting a $8.8 .8 billion shortfall over the next three years. And to the credit of our local legislators, it wasn't because they, you know, spent like drunken sailors. In fact, there was a $3 billion rainy day fund uh, uh, when they left Olympia. Unfortunately, it's not just raining, it's pouring. And so that uh, unfortunately is driving... Um, uh, some some of the challenge here. So here's why this matters to all of the employers who are on the line. One, if the state is looking at that level of uh, revenue shortfall, you know, you've seen the governor, for example, issue a directive to our higher ed education institutions to prepare for a 15 to 20 percent budget reduction. Having worked in economic development professionally, I can tell you that the work that our community colleges do that our universities do, and frankly, that K-12 does, is a really important component of our competitiveness. And so I'm concerned, and we should all be concerned about potential substantial cuts to higher education um, uh, in particular, because they're not constitutionally protected. 
Uh, second, there's jobs attached to those funding reductions. We've already seen, you know, for example, in the city of Tacoma, uh, a few hundred people who have been laid off as a consequence of revenue shortfalls. And according to the chairman of the Fed, the way this recession becomes a long-term depression is if we see a whole slate of public sector job losses. And, you know, and frankly, these are our teachers, these are uh, firefighters, these are first responders, you know, many of the people that we've been celebrating for being on the front lines of this are also unfortunately the people most likely to, uh, to lose their jobs uh, in the absence of further federal action. Um, and then the third piece of this obviously is um, in the absence of federal support, the state may look to, um, to revenue. And, you know, obviously this is a time where our local employers are already uh, strained, and that could be a tough, uh, a tough conversation. So that's why the House passed the Heroes Act, which included uh, substantial funding for state, local, and tribal uh, governments. Uh, unfortunately, the Senate proposal is uh, one sixth of what the House has proposed, and so that's one of the areas where you see uh, disagreement. Um, you know, I, I have a strong appetite for uh, seeing a deal struck between the House and the Senate by Democrats and Republicans, but it has to be a deal that actually helps the communities I represent. Let me, uh, I'm on the home stretch here. Let me just mention a couple other things and I know you wanna hear uh, from the public health leadership as well. A fourth component of this, and I know this is on a lot of people's minds, is childcare. Uh, the House actually passed two childcare bills just a couple weeks back. Uh, one called the Child Care is Essential Act to provide grant funding to childcare providers to try to stabilize that sector and to make sure they have the resources necessary so that they can meet health and safety uh, guidelines and care for kids in a setting that actually uh, works. Um, and the other is a bill called the Child Care for Economic Recovery Act, which provides support both to child care providers and to working families that, are, that may otherwise struggle to afford child care. I look at the provision of safe uh, child care as an economic development issue too. You know, the ability of people to be able to get back to work may be hamstrung if they don't have someplace safe and healthy to keep their uh, uh, kids during the day. So uh, this component around child care is Im important as well. Final thing I want to say is um, I generally have bristled when I've heard the press referred to what Congress has done as stimulus. I actually don't think that's true. I think what you've largely seen is an effort to stop the bleeding. At some point, you may very likely uh, see some stimulus happen. Um, the House actually passed a big infrastructure bill called the Moving Forward Act, uh, and it dealt with things like roads and bridges, uh, transit systems, our power grid, uh, and something I think that's important to all of us during this pandemic, uh, access to, to broadband. I think we've learned during the course of this pandemic that uh, access to high-speed internet is not just about whether you can watch the Great British Baking Show on Netflix, but also, you know, can you keep operating your business if your storefront shut down? Or, you know, can your kids keep learning uh, even when school in person has been canceled? And that's why the Moving Forward Act was passed. I wish I could tell you I was confident that that was going to move in the Senate. I don't think that's true, um, but I think it laid it put down an important marker where I think you know potentially as early as in the new year you could see a big infrastructure bill uh, pass. Uh, I'm also working with a lot of the uh, economic development leadership here in the state of Washington on some effort focused on worker training. The chair of the Fed said one of the risks out of this pandemic is the potential for skills erosion, where um, people have either haven't been able to come back to work or may not have a job to come back to. And so I've sponsored a bill called the Skills Renewal Act, also a bipartisan bill that would create some um, help for folks to go uh, enter an apprenticeship program or take college classes or do retraining programs or even just refresh their skills. But that's important um, so that people can earn a good living, um, even in the face of this. I'll just end by saying, uh, I know sometimes it's hard when the you know, thankfully you saw four uh, uh, pandemic response bills that were bipartisan. I know it's challenging when we see the media reports of disagreements. Um, you know, listen, this pandemic doesn't know red districts from blue districts and it's impacting every American across the country. And I think this is a time for us to be laser focused on a comprehensive response that's guided by public health, that empowers small businesses like many of you on the line to just lead our economic recovery and that leaders from both parties should be able to champion and get behind. And, and um, my hope is that out of everything that we've been through and are still going through now, that we've got to make sure that there's a new normal 
that's better than the old and that our region and our country are stronger than ever before. And that's, that's when, when I look to a fifth coronavirus response bill, that's what I want to see so that we can all come out of this stronger. So let me end there and uh, I'll look forward to your questions. I see one question in the general chat asking came if, back from a search. Oh, geez. Um, asking about 501c6 orgs. Yeah, the, the HEROES Act, which passed the House, um, includes uh, assistance to 501c6s as well. And again, that hasn't been passed into law. That's part of, you know, and when I say this, I'm not saying this in a partisan way. It's just a statement of fact. It was three months ago that the, past, that the House passed a fifth coronavirus response bill. Uh, you saw for 10 weeks, the Senate uh, leadership, Senator McConnell basically said, let's pause any further action. Now they're negotiating just over these last two weeks. Um, uh, so it's, I, I wish I could tell you, Mickey, that, you know, this is how it's going to, how it's going to pan out. I can tell you what the house position was and that was expanding assistance to cover 501 C6s. All right. Do we have any other questions? You can, you know, raise your hand, put it in chat. I'm happy to stick around too, Kathy, if folks okay. have questions after, after John. Okay, super, thank you. Okay, John, then, um, oh, wait. There is a new question from Denise. Those of us in business have revised our budgets and pivoted necessarily due to the business closures. How are government agencies doing the same? Well, I, I mentioned, Denise, and good to hear from you. Um, you know, uh, for good or for bad, you're seeing a lot of municipalities making pretty substantial layoffs uh, and cuts to services. The concern is um, obviously one that has an impact on the local economy when you see a bunch of municipal workers laid off. That has an impact on their ability to go uh, uh, shop your local businesses um, uh, because they're out of work. Uh, Similarly, the state is projecting a very substantial budget shortfall. And, you know, unlike the federal government, um, state and local governments can't run a, can't run a deficit. And so that's, uh, that's part of the rationale behind trying to provide some additional support. And again, I look at this from the standpoint of, uh, of how do we, um, you know, what's in the best interest of our economy over the long term. If we see a whole slate of, uh, of layoffs, and this isn't Derek Kilmer saying this, this is the chair of the Fed, uh, you know, this recession could, could become a long-term depression. Operationally, there's also some changes, not just in terms of budgets, but there's operationally, you're seeing federal agencies, you know, the VA has gone overwhelmingly to telehealth, for example, um, there's a lot of agencies, you know, including my office where everybody's working remotely, still doing the casework that we do on a daily basis. Um, you know, uh, and for what it's worth for anybody watching, if you have any issues where we can lend a hand, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to my team, but you know, we're, we're doing it remotely. Uh, anybody who has a family member who works at the Naval Shipyard can tell you operationally, things look very different right now. You're getting your temperature taken when you come in. Um, there's social distancing. In the history of the shipyard, they'd never telecommuted before. There's still about 3,000 people who are teleworking. So you've seen some changes operationally as well. But from a budget standpoint, um, you know, right now it's taking the form of very substantial cuts and job losses, which I think we should all be concerned about. Yeah, we do know that um, in Washington in July, um, Department of Commerce staff had one furlough day a week. This month they have one furlough day and they are not allowed to even check their email on those furlough days. It's that serious, so. I, uh, I can tell you I'm married to a state employee and she's in the same boat. Okay, all right. I don't see any other questions, and if they do pop up, we will take them at the end. And now I, again, thank Derek and John. Um, it's your show, share the screen, and we appreciate you spending time with us again. Well, thank you, Kathy. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here again and to share with the group. Uh, I just wanna say how much we value this opportunity because we're speaking to the people that are 
obviously directly impacted by COVID within our community as, as business leaders. But additionally, we need your help. Uh, you are also partners in stemming the spread of the coronavirus within our community. And so that's why I'm here today, because I wanted to share with you a little bit about what we've experienced working with employers and workplaces over the last couple of months, and the part that you can play in, again, protecting your workforce and really protecting your business in this, uh, I'll say, turbulent time. Um, there's been a lot of lessons learned, and I'm going to try and share a little bit of those today. We'll walk through a, a presentation. I'll share my screen here in a second. Uh, there'll be an opportunity again for questions, but I do want to point out, because I know this question always comes, is a lot of the information that I'm about to share is, is right from our website and or uh, links to other very important websites like the uh, Washington State Department of Health, the CDC, or the Governor's Safe Start resources on his website, or I should say the Washington State Coronavirus page. So those resources are available to you and, and uh, a lot of this data that I'm gonna share is, uh, is from that. Additionally, uh, one thing I really wanna point out, when I share these facts and figures, please understand that our, our situation changes uh, weekly, daily, almost sometimes with what we know, what we learn, the trends we see in numbers. Uh, so please understand that, uh, you know, Maybe some of these slides might be two days old, but they already feel outdated in certain things. So I just want to highlight that when we talk about these numbers, because people say, well, there's only this many cases today. That's true, but that's today, and tomorrow might be a different story. So again, uh, uh, just some high level notes there. So with that, I'll jump into this. Uh, there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end. Hopefully I can help answer some of those things. But again, I just want to say thank you for being willing to listen and being willing to be partners in helping protect our community and your businesses. So with that, we'll get going on a screen share. Now let me switch to that. Oh, I apologize, I think you're seeing, up. Oh, you're seeing the right thing now. If someone can confirm you have the proper PowerPoint in front of you. Yes, we see it says COVID-19 in our workplaces. Excellent, then we're in the right place. Zoom's always a challenge, but we're learning as we go. So with this, uh, again, this is uh, similar to a presentation I gave to this group a couple of months ago, but again, focusing now on workplace issues and the lessons we've learned uh, over the last couple of months. So. Again, my name is John Keese. My normal job is the director of the Environmental Health Division here at the Health District. I've been uh, part of the COVID incident response team for many months now and don't see that going away anytime soon. But uh, let's go ahead and look at what we've learned and where we stand today. Um, this graph here in front of you is, again, straight off our website. And hopefully you can see my cursor here, but as we have kind of looked at our history, we saw that initial wave when COVID first hit our community. Uh, you know, we know that a lot of restrictions were put in place, businesses were shut down, that sort of thing. And we saw a great decrease in cases and a real steady state uh, where we, we were doing really well. And we were hoping that, okay, we're getting ahead of this thing. Unfortunately, as restrictions eased and people got back out in the community and doing things, we saw a significant increase in cases. And you can just look at this and see that these numbers here and the total caseload was much higher than we'd ever experienced even early on. This was of great concern. Uh, we were dealing with lots of new cases every day. And the concern was, have we reached a point in our community where the spread of the virus is almost unchecked now, despite our best efforts and despite many people's best efforts to get ahead of it? Uh, the answer appears to be no, we're not quite there because we did see a decrease uh, once we got into August. And we're thankful for that. We hope that this initial bump, or I should say this big bump in July was due to sort of the everybody cutting loose, so to speak, when, when restrictions were lifted. Uh, but hopefully we've kind of settled in. We still do have a lot of cases and that's of concern, um, but we have we have kind of reached this new steady state 
um, again, we hope to be decreasing as we go. Where do we stand in the recovery process? As many of us know, uh, we're still in phase two of the governor's Safe Start plan. Uh, what, and if, if this is news to you, I'm sorry, but uh, we all know we are approaching phase three. Our, our ho hope was to get to phase three to allow businesses to operate a little more freely with re less restrictions. However, as we were as on the previous slide demonstrated, as we entered July, we saw a significant increase in cases. So right about the time, uh, late June, when we applied for phase three, our metrics really took a turn for the South. And uh, we did not meet many of the standards that the state has set up to move into a, a new phase. Additionally, we saw across Washington State, many counties struggling with this and great numbers of increasing cases statewide. So the, the governor's office put a hold on anybody moving forward in a phase. And at this time, we're still, we're still in phase two. Uh, we should be following phase two guidelines. Hopefully we can get to a point with phase three again. Uh, the picture is not just Kitsap County, but uh, statewide we are seeing a little bit of a decrease and, and hopefully we'll get back into a position where we're ready to move ahead and, and uh, lift restrictions. Again, the fear is what we saw in, at the uh, end of June and into early July though, as soon as restrictions are lifted, the numbers go right back up. So we want to try and stay ahead of that. And this is the real reason I really wanted to talk with you guys again today. This number of increasing outbreaks, and outbreaks are defined as uh, basically workplace or congregate living exposures where we know there was transmission occurring in that setting. Many of our cases early on were household contacts, which almost goes without saying, if someone comes home with coronavirus, they're likely to spread it to their household. However, we saw a significant increase in the number of workplace-related exposures. And what that was causing was more and more problems for employers as we talked to them about sick employees and uh, the concerns with what was going on within their workplaces. You get too many people out sick, you end up having to close your doors. And we wanted to prevent that, and we wanted to help employees uh, help their employer, I'm sorry, employers help their employees to prevent the spread uh, within the workplaces, and also in some ways, then those workplace exposures taking those right back home, and we get those household contacts again. Um, it's kind of a, a push-pull scenario. Some things happen first, some things happen second, but these things are related. Again, we saw an increasing number of outbreaks though and really wanted to talk with you about that. So these things we know about, uh, I'm, I'm putting this up here again because you know, there's sort of this, well, what, what can I do as an employer? And I think there's, there's two things we have to look at when we talk about coronavirus and, and precautions to prevent the spread. One, there's personal responsibility. And as an employer, you know, we have families, we have friends, we need to take personal responsibility about our own actions and implementing healthy behaviors. We know them all, we've heard them all, distancing, hand washing, the use of face coverings. But as an employer, you have perhaps a little bit beyond that. You can do something to help prevent the spread of the virus, again, within your workplace for your employees or patrons of your business. And we wanna do that because it, it, we've, again, seen more and more of these circumstances where we can try and get ahead of this. And we wanna to work together with this, understanding that if everyone does their part, then we can make a better, a better change in this direction of things. So these things, again, this is not new information what I'm presenting to you now. And I want you to be aware of them. But as we go into the more detail aspect of it, what does that mean? How do we, how do we implement these sorts of things? And as many of you know, there are guidances for each type of business, as well as sort of a general guidance for all businesses to help you set up a safe workplace. Um, the number one thing you can do is keep the virus out of your workplace. And that means making sure that people are not coming to work sick. I cannot tell you the number of case investigations that we have done over the last couple of months 
where people said, well, I went to work sick. And, you know, when we talk about what symptoms did they have? Well, I had a little cough, but I thought it was just allergies or my throat tickled a little bit or my nose was a little bit runny. And what's happening is they're going to work sick in the, in the, what we call the negative two days. And those are the day zero, we consider your symptom onset. And day negative one and negative two, you are contagious, but you don't generally have a lot of symptoms. And that's the challenge with coronavirus is that you can be spreading this disease around long before you are very sick. And lots of people are going to work sick. There are not enough exclusions for these types of folks, or they say, well, I had to be there. And again, the have to be there is putting your business at risk. The best thing you can do is keep people out. If they have any symptoms, even if they say, well, it's just allergies or it's just a little cough, we are in a new time frame where people need to understand that any little new, you know, nagging cough or I don't feel so good today, whatever it might be, things that we would previously dismiss, this is a new world where we have to think about this could be COVID. I may have been exposed. I may be developing symptoms. And you aren't full-blown sick yet, but again, you are in a contagious period where if you go to work, you are likely to share that with your coworkers. So having strict policies about, again, testing for symptoms, asking for employee you know, attestations about exposures and or illness, being smart with your employees. I know it's easy to say, well, I can't get anybody else in here today. I need to bring this person in. Uh, it's just a little cough. Well, maybe you can wait a day or two and see what happens. Uh, it, you need to be able to think about those things because, again, you're putting your whole workplace at risk. Additionally, when someone does test positive, you need to be able to work with the health district because what we do is we contact that person immediately. We, we ask them about their employer and their workplace, and we work then to contact you and, and talk with you through the situation. What other close contacts do they have? How do you identify those folks so that those folks can be quarantined to prevent the spread of the virus, again, within your workplace? Uh, you want to be able to do that on your own, but as well as when we call to, to, again, limit the spread. We want to work with you. We need to work with you. And, and what I will say is employers are required to work with us. So I know it's hard because we want to say, well, I want to protect my employees' uh, you know, privacy and that sort of thing. But if you don't give us that information, then we can't contact these people to talk to them about their exposures and or their symptoms to, to help protect your business. So we need your help in this. Uh, this is essential. And again, we're, we're trying to get ahead of a problem that's gonna help protect you and keep your doors open. You know, one of the things that we hear a lot is, again, this, this I just went to work, uh, you know, I had a little cough. And again, mild symptoms are very common. No symptoms prior to you know, being sick, that zero, negative one, negative two days. Um, this is a real issue where people keep going to work sick until they're so sick they can't go to work. But again, by then they've exposed everyone else in your workplace. So please implement these practices to keep people out. It's gonna be the best thing for you long-term, even though you might be down an employee or two, it's gonna protect the workforce. So please follow these guidances and put together a plan that will, you can work with your employees as well as educate them about this. One thing that we hear a lot about are essential workers. As we know, many of our businesses have been deemed essential and many of them are essential. Uh, there are, is guidance out there, especially CDC guidance, uh, as well as Department of Health guidance, about essential workers working. So one thing that we want to stress to you is under the essential worker guidance, it says that you can allow a worker who has been exposed to COVID to come to work, but that's between you and them. Our recommendation to all people who are exposed to COVID is to quarantine at home for 14 days. Under the essential worker guidance, you can allow someone to work. However, 
they still are quarantined. They need to not be going to the grocery store. They need to not be doing social gatherings with their friends. They can go to work, but they can't, they shouldn't be doing other things. They should still be quarantining. Additionally, if they go to work, they should be following increased protections, the use of more personal protective equipment or PPE, more distancing if possible. You don't want to have staff avoid testing as a close contact. Well, oh, maybe if they don't test, then they can keep coming to work. That's not a good idea because, again, you're putting both their health and the health of their coworkers at risk by having them avoid testing. Additionally, if people develop symptoms as a close contact, they should not be going to work. So anybody with symptoms, whether they're uh, you know, a contact or not a co contact, should not be going to work. So essential worker guidance, it, it does allow for work, but there are strict conditions and we still wanna make sure that those are being followed so that you can protect your workplace. Now, one thing that's also a challenge for employers is what about my employees' personal lives? You don't get to say on what they do after work or before work, but there are some things that you need to be aware of and you should try and encourage your employees to think about. These, these things listed here, these household contacts, large gatherings, uh, travel and carpools, these are common sources of exposure. And we're seeing those, if people do these things, then they come to work or they get it at work and then go do those things and spread the virus within our community. You wanna be aware that even if your practices at your workplace are, are really tight and you're, and you're really working with your employees well, you wanna have them consider these things. We've, we've talked to multiple employers who said, well, at work, they six feet apart, they wear their masks, everybody's doing their thing. But then we say, well, wait a minute, how'd they get there? They carpool with three other employees. And guess what's not happening? They're not distancing. They're not wearing masks. So you might want to encourage them to, to think about these things because there's no reason to do it once they enter your doors if they're just going to go out and, and do something else as soon as they're outside of work. Um, you want to encourage this sort of thing because it's going to help your, them, but also you. Uh, you need to work together with this. And... These are common, common stories. I, I, I wish I could share with you uh, many of them, but they're about people's medical information, but these are not unusual, I'll put it that way. And you gotta do the best you can to have your employees take this seriously, not only in the workplace, but outside of it. That's that personal versus you know, employer level of responsibility. And finally, here's the listing of, of things I mentioned early on in this conversation was some of the resources that are available to you. Uh, you've, you've probably been to some of these websites before. I'm sure uh, the association here has links uh, to some of this stuff on their own website. Please look at these things. Please contact our office if you have questions. What does this mean? How do I do these things? We want to assist businesses with the technical assistance and that sort of thing, or what we know has worked in other situations. Talk to your peers, your industry, you know, uh, similar types of businesses, uh, those sectors, because they see, oh, this is what works in this type of setting. This is what works in that type of setting. Um, we know that some of these things can be effective because there's businesses who have kept themselves, you know, free from the virus. And we want to continue to try and uh, encourage that to help one another. So that's all I have for you on that presentation. And I do wanna be able to try and answer some questions for you and, 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 uh, and let you know what we can do or, or what we can recommend. Um, so at this time, I'll just leave it up to some Q&A and, and uh, we'll go from there. Okay, thank you. There are a couple of things I see for you. Um, so, Sean says, Derek Kilmer pointed out testing and getting test results in a timely manner with consistency is critical to improving our outcomes and curing the economic coma our communities are facing. Kitsap has not been able to track negative results nor get test results back in a timely manner. What changes should be instituted to improve our outcomes and our ability to manage the risk? Thank you, Sean. Uh, good question. Uh, yes, in the last couple of days, uh, we've heard about some problems reporting negative test results from the Washington State Department of Health. Uh, Department of Health receives all the test results uh,
from around the state, and then those are shared with the local health jurisdictions, and that's what we're reporting to you. Unfortunately, they had a breakdown in their system, and so our negative results were not available. The problem with not having a negative result is one, it doesn't tell you the number of cumulative tests that are administered, but also it helps that number is essential for us to do the metrics on our positivity rate and that sort of thing, you know, for the number of tests, how many are actually positive. That, that situation has been sorted out. Department of Health does have that fixed. There was a problem with the data, and this is not new, this originally happened months ago. The system was never built for this volume of data. And so the negative tests had to be, a whole new uh, tracking database had to be developed to be able to answer the, or you know, administer and, and uh, manage all those numbers. So sometimes they're working out kinks as they go. That system is back in working order now. And so you'll see updated information on our website. Uh, it, it's, a, it, it's a challenge in this time. Uh, there's been moments where you feel like you're building the airplane while you're flying it. And when we're dependent upon other data systems, it, 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 there are breakdowns. So the good news is that seems to be fixed uh, at the state level. And I'm gonna keep scrolling down here. Yeah, looks like there's another one from Sean about yes, the about network. about healthcare, the capacity of the healthcare system. That's a great question, Sean. Uh, and that's something we try and also keep our tabs on. The healthcare system, especially the hospitals and their bed capacity, they report to a state network. And then that, again, that number is, is shown on our website. If you go to our webpage, and let me sh uh, screen share again real quick. I wanna point this out to everybody. I apologize for the delay here. I'm gonna go ahead and share our screen to the Kitsap Public Health District website. So here on our main page, if you click through to the COVID page, you'll see right here, this data dashboard, if you, this link, if you click to that, this is what I think Sean might be referring to, is you can look at the various sections of what we call our, our sort of assessment of where we stand. And one of those things that we look at in, in real you know, uh, key focus, uh, we'll just look at the dashboard as a summary, is our, is our hospital numbers. How many people are hospitalized versus our total capacity? Uh, if we scroll all the way over here, uh, here's hospitalizations. Um, and then our hospital capacity numbers. Uh, as you're scrolling, I would just encourage anyone who has not been on their website, this is a very thorough and impressive dashboard. I think you would be surprised at the level of detail available. Thank you for saying that, Kathy. I know our epidemiological team as well as our assessment team, the same people, they've worked really hard to be able to try and share as much information as possible. We want to just be transparent with our community about what we know and the numbers behind all these reports and that sort of thing. So uh, hopefully this is helpful. I, I recommend, again, you're right, everyone should scroll through this and see for themselves as opposed to maybe getting reports on Facebook about things. Um, but here uh, to answer Sean's question about healthcare capacity, this is our percentage of beds occupied in our hospitals. And you can see this number has been kind of petering along in the 60s percentage. Um, that does meet the standards of what we want to see in regard to hospital capacity. You know, this, this concern about hospitals being overrun, which we've heard so much about in the flattening the curve. The good news is our hospitals have learned a lot how to better do patient care, as well as how to better manage, uh, you know, who's going to get admitted and who's not. Um, so we're in a better, better spot there. And we do meet the metric, I'll put it that way. Our concern, of course, as I end that, is that, you know, do we have those resources available? And yes, those hospitals have surge plans in place. Um, again, we do meet those uh, numbers today as far as capacity and resources for PPE and staffing and that sort of thing. We're, we're keeping a constant eye on that because what we don't want to see is that 
become uh, a situation where our healthcare system is being overrun with the number of illnesses and hospitalizations. Let's see here. I'm just scrolling down to, again through the chat to see if there's anything else specific uh, to health district questions. I didn't. I mean, I, I don't see anything. Um, there were some comments and um, about Olympic College. Um, and Amy, do you want to just talk about that for a minute? Amy? Okay, she might have stepped away. Um, and then um, Gary Simpson noted that the sheriff's um, office is being asked to make a 10% cut in their 2020 budget and another 20% for 2021. Um, so we all know that that probably means not filling open positions, um, not sure about layoffs and you know what it will create as far as first responders. Um, so there are some concerns out there in relation to the question about public agency and government agency cuts. I just um, promoted Amy to a panelist so she can talk if she's still with us. Are you still there, Amy? Yes, actually, yeah, I just sent there you a you note. I, I wasn't able to unmute. So um, yeah, I just wanted to, to thank you, um, Derek, for mentioning the community and technical colleges because we really feel that we're part of the solution of reopening and remaining competitive um, economically. Um, we're really lucky, a couple programs that we've been able to keep going are our nursing programs from nursing assistant on up. Because we have simulation, we can you know, sanitize mannequins, we can run computer programming, and bring students in in a responsible manner. But there's a lot of simulation technology out there from culinary to welding that um, additional resources that um, we could buy packages and share between and among the community colleges to do this remotely, that when we do reopen, we're ready, we're prepared, we're you know, here to support the businesses. Thank you, Amy. Amy, would you just introduce yourself Oh, my apologies, yeah. So my name's Amy Hatfield. I'm the Dean of Workforce Development and Basic Studies at Olympic College. Um, I've been there in this role for over 10 years. I also serve as a board of um, board member on the National Council for Workforce Education. Thank you, Amy. Amy's a great partner with Kitsap Economic Development Alliance and um, the business community. Um, and if you don't know Amy, I'm happy to introduce you. Um, and then Jamie is with us today. If Jamie, you want to share a few words? Sure. Thanks, Kathy. Um, yeah, I would say that right now, all of us um, certified business advisors across the country feel like we're in a lull right now until new legislation gets passed. And then we figure, you know, we're going to be on the front lines again, trying to help people navigate, you know, the um, the federal disaster relief or local that they've already gotten and try and merge it in with any you know, new options that come up. So we're trying to be prepared, trying to do a little self care before another onslaught. Um, but the only other thing I'd say right now um, is that um, if you are at the point where you're doing, looking at a PPP forgiveness application, hold off because it's likely to get to change um, you know, to get easier. And we, we found out things that were unintended consequences, like people who got their PPP loans through FinTech, like QuickBooks or whatever, QuickBooks sold your loan. <laughs> and so you don't even know who's holding your loan right now, um, which can be frustrating if you're trying to submit your forgiveness application and don't know who has the loan. So things like that are going on. Um, you know, come and, uh, you know, Tell us who you come and be a client at the SBDC and we'll keep you in the loop and you'll have the ability to ask quick questions or, you know, set up a meeting um, as new developments come up. So that's all I have, Kathy. Thanks, Jamie. I feel like PPP is like a, a never ending circle of changes. 
Well, everything has been, because what you realize is, first of all, I mean, you know, uh, Congress and, uh, and Senate, they pass these things, and then, you know, they're expected to be online and working in a week, and, you know, how that's an amazing, you know, thing, to, you know, to attempt, and then, of course, fixes were made and changes were made along the way, you know, the most crushing one being when, first of all, everybody was going to get a $10,000 grant, uh, and then they quickly went, yeah, we don't have the money for that, so how about if we do $1,000? Um, per employee up to $10,000. So things like that happened along the way. And so we've just kind of been the navigators at the SBDC to help small businesses navigate these options and figure out if they can use idle for payroll when they have PPP and all sorts of, you know, things that we're trying to um, help people, like I said, just sort of navigate them and um, use them to the best possible advantage. Thank you. And again, um, I personally am thankful and everyone at KEDA for um, Jamie and having a KITSAP SBDC. This is a long time coming and we're thankful that Jamie's, you know, our counselor here and we find them to be one of our best partners. Um, Congressman Wait, Kilmer. Say, oh, I was just going to interrupt and say back at you because I look a lot smarter because of KEDA. Teresa and Kathy have just been amazing partners for me. So. Okay, well, in the love fest there. Congressman <laughs> Kilmer, any last words? <laughs> um, let me end where I began with it, which is with gratitude to, to Kita and to all the employers in Kitsap County. I know this has been a challenging time. Uh, and for those who are, are weathering the storm, um, if there's anything I can do or our office can do to lend a hand, please don't hesitate to re reach out. We work for you. And uh, I'm, I, I'm conscious that this virus is very contagious, but it's not the only thing that's contagious. So is caring about your community and caring about each other. And that's something Kids Have County is really good at. So keep at it. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. Um, Teresa is reminding me that um, people should be watching for a new CARES grant program coming through funding from the state to KEDA. And then um, watch for a potential phase four with the county funds. And then John, do you have any last words for us? Well, again, I just wanna echo Representative Kilmer's uh, statements there. I just wanna say thank you to KEDA for the part you play in protecting the health of our community, you and all the, all the members. Uh, when we protect our workplaces, we protect our, our greater community, uh, both economically and, and with our health. So thank you for that. And thank you for the opportunity to share today. Right. Well, we thank you both again for taking time this morning to share with us. Um, appreciate the questions from those watching. And please feel free to always contact, you know, the speakers that we've had today or the KEDA offices. Um, if we don't know the right answer, we will figure out who probably does. So thank you and have the rest of your day be great. Bye.